nonprofit organization devoted to carrying forward the legacy and values of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt by developing progressive ideas and bold leadership in the service of restoring America's promise of opportunity for all. To learn more, please visit their website at rooseveltinstitute.org. Before we get started, I have just a few announcements. Books are for sale in the lobby, courtesy of the Bookseller Bookstore, one of our valued partner bookstores here, independent bookstores here in Chicago. Ms. Crawford will sign books immediately after the program in the lobby. And at this time, please turn off all noise-making electronic devices. <clears throat> Tonight's program is being recorded for Chicago Amplified, a web-based audio library of diverse educational events recorded throughout the Chicago region. You can hear this and other informative public programs by going online to wbez.org slash amplified. So tonight, we're very pleased to welcome Susan Crawford. Ms. Crawford is a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, where she leads the Institute's telecommunications equality project on making high-speed internet access a universal, affordable resource for all Americans. Tonight, she will dis discuss her new book titled, <coughs> excuse me, titled Captive Audience, The Telecom Industry and Monopoly Power in the New Gilded Age. Ms. Crawford is a professor at Cardozo Law School and an adjunct professor at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. She regularly contributes to Bloomberg View and Wired and is a member of Mayor Michael Bloomberg's Advisory Council on Technology and Innovation. Ms. Crawford served as Special Assistant to the President for Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy during 2009 and co-led the FCC transition team between the Bush and Obama administrations. She is a member of the boards of Public Knowledge and TPRC, as well as a faculty co-director of the Berkman Center at Harvard University. Ms. Crawford received her BA and JD from Yale University. We're so pleased to have her. So please join me in welcoming Susan Crawford to the Chicago Public Library. I also want to thank Alyssa Taylor, who's with me here from the Roosevelt Institute for helping with many of the arrangements. And I really couldn't be happier uh, than to talk to you today. Chicago is a special place in this story. So let, let's, let's talk about it. You're a, you're a very imaginative group, so cast your mind backwards to the mid-30s, when electricity in America was considered to be a luxury, not a utility. Running water, that was utility, but not electricity. In the mid-30s, 90% of farmers in America did not have electricity. And Robert Carroll writes beautifully about this period in his books, especially about the people in the hill country outside Austin, who said, we read all about FDR's wonderful fireside chats, and we loved FDR, but we couldn't hear them because we didn't have electricity. It just hadn't reached us. So cast your mind forward to today. Today, if you're a parent somewhere in suburban America, or even in many downtowns, you may not have wired internet access at home. Many parents take their kids to the parking lots of libraries and park outside in the hopes that the public Wi-Fi spot will still be open after the library's hours are over. The Wall Street Journal recently had a big article about this on the front page of kids doing their homework at McDonald's, just trying to find a place where they could get adequate internet access. Now, the electricity story was changed by great leadership by FDR, who said after his time, particularly in Georgia, he understood how important it was for all Americans to have a reliable electrical connection. And so although private companies at the time controlled 85% of uh, electricity distribution, 14 very large combines had consolidated to control all of that. He took on those special interests and through lots of nudging and legislation and leadership changed the picture for America. The question is whether we're going to change the picture for high-speed wired internet access. We have a major problem in America. 19 million Americans can't 
buy wired internet access is just not available where they live. A third of Americans, including 40% of Chicagoans, don't have internet access at home for many reasons. For many of them, the reason is cost. And in Chicago, not having wired internet access at home is very closely correlated with socioeconomic status. So if you were poor, less educated, very unlikely uh, that you're going to have wired internet access at home. And people who do have wired internet access at home here in Chicago go online every day. People who don't have it at home go online, about 7% of them go online every day. So there's a huge disparity uh, between people who have online access and people who don't. And the people who do have wired internet access, including people here in Chicago, are paying a lot for it. So we're paying, rich people in America are, are being gouged, basically, for the service that's being sold to them, mostly by the cable industry, and I'll describe how this came about. Poor people are often left out. And the country as a whole is falling far behind in the national competition uh, between other nations around the world, where other countries take this very seriously. The cost of internet access is squeezing out other essentials. The Wall Street Journal has reported on this extensively. People will give up their smartphone only after they've given up almost everything else in life, because it's one of the great human needs to be able to communicate. And so uh, essentials like uh, food, and medicine, and housing get squeezed by the tremendous expense of what should be a basic utility available to everyone. Because you need wired internet access in order to get a job these days. 80% of jobs you have to apply online. Very hard to do that using a wireless device. To start a business, to get access to the most advanced healthcare. There are lots of wonderful courses being in, uh, offered online. You can't get access to those courses or a top flight education without a wired internet connection at home. It's just a fact of life. And so although gas and water and electricity are heavily regulated in the United States, we try to keep the cost down and make sure that everybody has access at reasonable cost, we have left internet access out of this story as a matter of the social contract for the entire country. How did we get here? Well, in 1996, we believed that competition and the free market would protect Americans. It would make sure that everybody got wired internet access at a reasonable cost. We believed that the phone companies would battle it out with the cable companies who in turn would battle it out with wireless. All of those assumptions turned out to be wildly heroic. We were wrong. Because where consolidation is possible, competition is impossible. And so we've seen enormous deregulation over the last 10 years, plus a wave of mergers. And that's left the country in a terrible state when it comes to wired internet access. Basically, we've got two separate markets these days for wired internet access in America. On the wired side, Comcast and Time Warner are the giants. Cable has one. Most people signing up for broadband at home are going with their local cable incumbent. These guys long ago divided up the country uh, between themselves. And they never enter each other's territories and they can raise prices at will. On the wireless side, AT&T and Verizon dominate. They account for most of the free cash flow, two-thirds of the subscribers, enormous barriers to entry in the form of spectrum holdings and lots of other assets. I'll spend most of my time today on the wired side of this equation, but just a moment on the relationship between wireless and wired. People often say, oh, don't worry. Wireless will do it because uh, you know it's going to be so advanced, it's going to take over from a wired connection. You need to know a little bit about the technology involved here to understand why that isn't so. A wireless transmission is just coming through the air from a cell tower and is subject to interference and degrades very sharply over distance. It could be as fast as a medium-slow cable connection, let's say 16 megabits per second download, or a moderate cable connection. But it's subject, the wireless side is subject to very steep usage caps. So as soon as you use more than one or two gigabytes of data, you run into an overage charge. And people don't use their wireless device as a result for watching video, doing a video conference call. Even if the download speed might be fast enough, it's really expensive. So 
So these two things are complements. They're not substitutable for each other. In fact, 83% of smartphone users in America also have a wired connection at home. So more about the wired world here and the, the wonderful world of cable. You can read this chart as a time series going from left to right. It shows us our, our future. It's based on FCC data in the 2010 uh, National Broadband Plan. So on the left, here's uh, broadband speed five years ago, one megabit per second download. And you can see cable and DSL, which is uh, high-speed internet access over a phone line, roughly comparable, about the same speed, same price, competitors battling it out for about half the country. As we move to the right to faster speeds, 10 megabits per second, which is roughly where we are today. Cable's the only choice for about half of Americans. Some other, maybe a quarter of Americans would have a choice of the AT&T U-verse system, which is uh, copper wire from a central point to the home, and then fiber from the central office to the network. So basically, an old telephone line serving homes plus faster connections in the midpoint. That will be available for these speeds, 10 megabits per second, for about a quarter of Americans. And then fiber to the home, uh, sold by Verizon mostly, the file system for 14%. But now look to the right, and this is our problem. For more than 80% of Americans, your only choice for the speeds that you'll need uh, for doing things like running a business from home, uh, having a presence in someone else's life through medical monitoring or otherwise, that's only going to be provided by your local cable incumbent. And we've got no competition and no oversight for that marketplace. They operate alone. Fios, the Verizon Fiber to the Home Network, is going to be available to perhaps 14% of Americans. But back in March 2010, Verizon announced that it was backing off. It wasn't going to make any more fiber installations. And it ceded the ground to cable it saw that it was so much cheaper for cable to upgrade its connections than for the phone companies to dig up their old copper lines and replace them with fiber that they just stepped away. And Verizon today is mostly a wireless company. So we're left with cable. We're left with cable. And life is very good for cable. So here's Comcast's average revenue per their bundle customers. And they, as you know, are very enthusiastic about bundles. Climbing steadily. That's the one takeaway from this chart over the last 10 years. Um, it, it really is uh, the founder of Comcast, Ralph Roberts, said it's like chicken in the grocery store. You can just raise your prices every six months, and as long as you do it slowly enough, no one, no one bothers. And uh, there's certainly no oversight of those prices. Here's the really telling point about all this. Back in 06, 05, uh, DSL and copper and, and cable were sharing the marketplace. So about half of new subscribers were going to the phone guys and half to cable. In the last quarter of 2012, 99% of wired, new wired internet access subscriptions for homes went to the local cable incumbent. People are fleeing DSL. Why? Because it's, it's just too slow. The capacity is not enough to keep up with what Americans want to do. We're an impatient country, and we have always wanted greater c communications capacity. Right now, it's only the cable companies who are offering it to us. So here's Brian Roberts. How many of you have ever heard of Brian Roberts before this? All right, we got one guy in front of us. He's the CEO of Comcast. And here he is speaking to Wall Street, his investors, in May 2011. He's talking about cable's future as a broadband distributor. He says, for that marketplace, we're 33%, 31% penetrated. He means in Comcast's footprint, which covers about 45% of Americans and 50 million American households. They have already about a third of the market. The goal would be 100 or 90% of broadband there. And he says, we have one competitor. That one competitor is Verizon. And he says, I like that position. Over the next 10 years, as people want more and more bits, I like that position. Well, of course he does. It's terrific. And it, this is completely rational for Comcast. They're not an evil company. In fact, they're a great American company. It's just that what's in the interests of their shareholders doesn't bring the entire country uh, the service that it needs. On the wireless side, um, we've got Verizon and AT&T, who, as I said earlier, are absolutely dominant and are themselves able to increase prices and uh, keep scarcity in place all around the country. 
So you may have thought of Verizon and AT&T as phone companies, and they are. They still provide a lot of the middle mile connections, the backhaul between uh, cities and, and the internet, and they're doing very well in that marketplace. But when it comes to consumers, they're really wireless companies now. So Verizon, two, more than two thirds of Verizon's revenue coming from wireless, and uh, same AT&T has held on to more of its copper lines. So it, it has a bit more on the wireline side of things. Verizon has been selling off, shedding <laughs> copper lines all over the country, leaving a lot of people in the hands of uh, second-rate uh, companies. And that, that's also a tragedy. It's, it's, a, it's mounting in the country. But uh, so really, they're wireless companies, and they like that marketplace because they can make uh, tremendous profits and are doing really extremely well. So here's another telling chart. This is European wireless service revenue per capita versus U.S. wireless service revenue per capita. Notice the U.S. line is steadily climbing while uh, the line in Europe goes down. That's because there's competition in Europe, and there isn't here. Um, basically, we have a duopoly with a fringe. There are two other national players, Sprint and T-Mobile, but they can't do much to pressure the prices that, that uh, AT&T and Verizon can charge. Also, at the same time, uh, these companies, and in particular Verizon, are arguing in front of our courts and our legislators and the FCC that they are speakers, that they're just like the New York Times or the Chicago Tribune, that they should have the right to edit, control, constrain our communications capacity. Now, we've always relied on um, private companies to sell us telecommunications, but they've always been burdened with public obligations like serving everybody, uh, making sure that we have services in an emergency, providing us with reporting, and allowing competition to share their lines. These guys want to be First Amendment speakers, which would trump the First Amendment rights of 300 plus million Americans. It's a very powerful argument being made by them. All of this is happening at a time when the rest of the world, the rest of the developed world, is very consciously moving towards fiber to the home as the basic network for all of their citizens. So I took a vacation in Seoul earlier this year, weird place to go on vacation, but it was very interesting. And there, if you move into an apartment in Seoul, you have a choice of three fiber to the home competitors. They also tell, sell TV services to you. They come within a day to install the service because competition is so tough, and it costs $30 a month. This is just unthinkable for us. In New York City, where I live now, 2.2 uh, Americans in, in New York City do not have wired internet access at all. And for the rest of them, if they tried to get a fiber service like this, it would cost $200 a month. But we're cheerful and resilient by nat nature, so what do we do? One of the things we should do is make it easier for cities to commission networks themselves. For example, Chicago could run a wholesale network through its sewer system and connect up city buildings and uh, also some of the business district and make sure that that wholesale facility was available to uh, lots of competitors at a retail price that was reasonable. It could uh, make sure that outlying suburbs were served eventually by this fiber to the home network. Right now, in 19 states, it's either difficult or Extremely, it's either very difficult or impossible for cities to do this for themselves. The incumbents have marched on state legislatures and have raised barriers all over the place to uh, cities making this decision. We need to roll back those laws. We need to make it easy for cities to do this because change at the federal level is going to take too long and we can't wait. So Google already did something in Kansas City. Seattle is moving with this right now. Chattanooga is an earlier example. Lafayette, uh, Louisiana, there are a bunch of cities across the country that are doing this, but we may, need to make it easier for them to route around the incumbents. We also need to make sure that every uh, communications provider is obliged to separate out content from conduit and ensure that if, if you're a transport player, you're not also selling content that you have an incentive to favor. Comcast right now has this in spades with its ownership of uh, NBCU. And we need more open networks around the country, wholesale, retail, just inputs into the economic growth 
and social, social and cultural well-being of the entire nation. So we've got to take that step. We've got to lower the barriers to capital. This is really just about money. Make it cheaper for competitors that want to build fiber networks across the country to do it. Maybe state infrastructure banks are a good answer. Uh, entities that have some skin in the game and are prepared to loan out capital that's going to be patient, that is going to pay for the installation of services and then pay itself back over time as new businesses arrive, as government lowers its cost of doing business. There are a bunch of ways that you save money once fiber is in the ground. And by the way, 80% of the cost of the fiber network is labor. So if we're looking for jobs for Americans, this is a good direction. So lowering the cost of capital and installing more of these networks uh, is clearly a direction we need to take. We need to make sure that uh, the companies don't have the ability to pick and choose winners and losers. So one of the things that we had in the telephone network was the assurance that if I made a call to my grandparents in Topeka, the carrier wouldn't take that call and route it to Chicago. You know, that we rely on these private actors to carry our treasured communications on condition that they treat them fairly. Right now, that regime is not in place for high-speed internet access, and it's a problem. It's a problem for any new business that depends on the grace of these huge companies for its survival, and we need to fix that situation. Most importantly, this has to get on the radar screen for Americans. Right now, high-speed internet access still sounds a little wonky, a little not uh, essential to human lives, but you and I know that's not true. We know that just like clean water and electricity, having a reliable internet connection is just an input into social, cultural, and economic life in America. We need to be electing people in this country on the basis that they're going to do something about our lack of affordable, ubiquitous access. We need to be asking questions at every single debate. Why isn't it? Why don't we have a world-class internet access network? The first generation of internet innovation came from America. The second generation will not. We don't have the sandboxes to play in. We are not leading the world. We should be looking at everybody else in the rear view window, and we're not. We did this with electricity. It took a lot of bravery. Uh, in today's times, there's a story in the front page of the business section about cities in America that have gotten sick of their private electrical utilities. Now, these are price-regulated guys, and they're taking this back into public hands because they want cleaner, cheaper, more ubiquitous electricity. That takes bravery. It took bravery to bring electricity to the country in the first place. Kansas City may shine as an initial fiber network in this country, but this is not Google's problem, and we should not be waiting for Google to reach the rest of the country. This is really a policy issue. So when you go home tonight and you turn on that sweet electric light, just remember that it took decades of effort to make sure that all of us have an inexpensive, reliable electrical connection, that this really is a public trust. And we need to be taking the same kinds of actions when it comes to high-speed internet access. So I wrote Captive Audience to bring this out to more people. And I hope you buy the book. And I hope you give copies of the book to your friends. And right now, I'd be delighted to answer any questions you have.